Hi everyone and welcome to Finance for Managerial Decision Making. This is Professor Watts and in this lecture today, Intro to Financial Management, we're just going to get an idea for what financial management is all about or managerial decision making is all about. So let's begin by just taking a glimpse at the field of finance and the kind of topics we'll be looking at and, and learning about in this course. First off, of course, financial management, which is our main focus. And within financial management, we have really three major areas of interest. One is securing funding for the firm. So a financial manager has to decide not only how much money its firm is going to need over its operating period, which could be a year or maybe even just a quarter, you know, three months out of the year, but how are you going to get that money? We, we might have retained earnings that we could use, you know, ca cash we've already earned that's sitting in the bank. Uh, if, we, if that's insufficient, we're going to have to borrow from a bank maybe or issue some debt in the debt markets, issue some stock in the equity markets or a combination of those three things. So there's a lot of decisions to be made just in terms of where do we get the money, the operating capital we might call it, that we need to keep the business going. Analyze and forecast the firm's performance. And this is where we'll get into what we call ratio analysis. So we look at how our firm is doing, not only with respect to the obvious things, like are we making money or not, so profitability, but how does our profit rate compare to competitor businesses within our industry? And then things uh, along the lines of how well are we using debt? Are we too indebted, borrowing too much money basically, and so on. And then last but not least, evaluating investment opportunities. This will be relevant for any business because businesses will always have opportunities to use funds, whether it's for internal projects, if they wanna expand, if they wanna open a new location or launch a new product line, or they might think that they should put some spare money into other investments and just be like passive holders of security so they can invest in stocks or bonds of other corporations or related kinds of investments. So the financial manager has to decide where to put the firm's funds to work. As we see, decision, decisions, decisions, and hence why we call the whole class finance for managerial decision making. What we're going to do in the whole class is look at the financial principles and financial fundamentals that guide us, that you, that you have to know about in order to make these decisions intelligently. Okay, now one of the other things we'll do in this class is take a, a overview look at financial markets and institutions. And specifically, uh, we're gonna talk about the role of financial intermediaries. Now there's a word that makes you sound smart, huh? Financial intermediaries. But all that is is the financial institutions that are the go-betweens, that's what intermediaries means, between people who have money, savers, investors, and people who need money. Businesses with investment projects, you know, we want to open up new stores, we want to launch new products, that kind of thing, or people who might want money for cons to pull consumption forward. So uh, households that have income and want to you know, buy a house or buy a car, things of that nature. So intermediaries are really important, financial intermediaries, and they're all around us and we pr probably all of us deal with them. We might not know them as intermediaries of so banks, insurance companies, and, and a whole slew of other financial type institutions are out there directing funds appropriately from people who have them to people who need them. And that's really what makes the economy go. So if intermediation is really important. Financial institutions are really important. We want to get an idea for the different kinds of institutions and, and how they operate and what kind of products and services that they provide. Financial instruments, that when we talk about products and services, we'll focus mostly in this class on securities, stocks and bonds and, and debt obligations, the kind of tools that businesses use to, to acquire funds and how they work and the, a lot of the terminology associated with them. So we'll spend some time talking about that. And then interest rates and rates of return, hugely important in finance. We're gonna, we're gonna do an entire lecture just on interest rates, in fact. Understanding price we have to pay for money and why that might be higher or lower and how the interest rate is going to factor into a whole lot of calculations that are, that are really at the heart of financial decision making. And we're gonna spend a lot of time on that and we're gonna work a lot of projects within Excel, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet software. Uh, where the math will be made easy for us because Excel will do the math, but we have to have an idea of how the different parts fit together. And interest rate is going to be a component part of a large amount of the financial calculations that we're interested in learning how to perform. Okay, now to talk about the bi a business or a firm, an organization, and its use of funds, capital, it's really helpful to think about balance sheet accounting and the balance sheet. And I hope you all have some exposure to this concept from your accounting courses or maybe even your econ economics courses in the past. 
This is often referred to as the fundamental accounting equation, and I think it's really tied for that distinction with the income statement equation, which of course is revenue minus expenses equals income. Or perhaps as important is the balance sheet equation, and here it is, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. This equation really describes the tools that a firm is working with in order to earn money, that's the assets, and then how they acquire those tools, or how they pay for those tools, how they fund those tools, that's the liabilities side or equity side. And then we could also think about, you know, how much wealth does the firm possess? That's really what the equity is. And the, the equity can come from investors, owners of the firm putting in their own wealth to begin with, or it can come in the, in the really successful corporations, the, the equity really comes from retained earnings, from having profits consistently year by year by year, and then plowing those back into the business. And then you build up a significant amount of equity over on the right-hand side of that equation, and that allows you to acquire more assets on the left-hand side of the equation. As you know from basic algebra, uh, in order for the, the left-hand side of the equation to grow, so in order for your assets to go up, one of these two things on this side has to go up. So either you get more equity, you get more ownership from people putting in uh, money, or the, the company reinvesting profits or from borrowing and that's of course when we're talking about liabilities we're talking about borrowing money from banks or from the bond markets issuing some kind of debt securities so you if you want more assets you gotta have more of one or both of these options and this is really describing then how businesses fund their operations we'll think about balance sheet accounting in the form of the classic T account where we we have a T here and assets go always go on the left hand side and if you're familiar with accounting, you'll remember that uh, these are in order of decreasing liquidity. And all that means is we list cash first, and then things that are not so liquid or not so convertible into cash. Okay, so that's how the assets works. And all of these things could be vehicles for making money, right? If you had a bunch of cash, well, we could put that into a, a buy securities with that, buy bonds with that, put it in a bank account and earn interest, okay? Uh, the land and buildings, of course, are the tools, uh, the capital stock used by a business to, to do its business and, and sell its product and make money. Right? So all of these things, we want to view them as money makers for the, for the business. Now, how do we acquire these? As I mentioned, we could issue liabilities. Okay, so we could do debt, which is borrowing, and there's many different forms that could take, and from simple bank loans, debentures, or, and bonds. And of course, we, we also want to talk about here uh, funds owed to other businesses during the course of normal operations, accounts payable. And then equity, which is the net worth after all of the liabilities are paid, how much asset value is left for the owners, net worth for owners of the business. And a corporation, that would be stockholders, and a proprietorship, that would be you know mom and pop who run the business. And the partnership, that would be the partners and so on. Okay, so that's why we, of course, we level it up here, owner's equity. When we think about finance for managerial decision-making, we want to think about the mixture of assets and, and liabilities slash equity. And the T account and the balance sheet equation is going to be a really powerful tool in helping us with that. So, okay, so just to summarize that concept, liabilities and equity represent the sources of funds. We're borrowing money from banks or the bond market. And then equity would represent an ownership claim or stake from the actual owners of the business. Assets represent uses of funds. And remember, we, we list these in declining liquidity, so we could just have a lot of money sitting around in the bank, but of course, we don't wanna have a whole lot of money sitting around in the bank because that hardly earns us anything. We'll talk about the idea of a yield curve later on. Short-term interest rates are usually low, but that's never gonna make us as much as running the business. So we have some operating assets, which would be things like plant and equipment, which of course are going to be unique to a business. If my, I'm running a lawnmower business, my equipment is my trucks and mowers, and all my uh, my mowing tools and I want to have that out there working as much as possible to be earning revenue to either pay off our liabilities and or build equity as we retain profits liabilities represent a debt claim money we owe and equity represents an ownership claim I think we've uh, we've covered that pretty thoroughly okay so keep in mind this this balance sheet tool if you're not familiar with it uh, we'll, we'll be using it a lot so you'll become familiar with it and, and this is a key to understanding how any business operates from the smallest mom and pop type business all the way up to the biggest corporations I want us just to think through maybe let's let's go back to the example of uh, I'll, I'll say this is my lawn mowing business it's called Tyler's Mow and Go so what's my balance sheet gonna look like on any given day well you know we've got um, a, a little bit of money in the bank just to and when we say cash it's typically you know that's money in our bank checking account just to, to pay for operations just a little contingency fund most of our assets are going to be plant and equipment 
which is our, you know, our mowers and our trucks that we used to drive them around. And, you know, maybe we have $50,000 worth of, of equipment. And for a small business, you know, that might be it. Larger businesses might also own some, some other uh, resources. We, you know, we might have some land. We might have a, a shop that we used to, to store the mowers and, and do maintenance and stuff like that. So we, can, we might have land slash buildings, land and, the, and our shop that we use to, to store and work on our equipment. Other businesses might list other things like securities here and even kind of intangible assets. The, the company's reputation might be so valuable that they ha have to list it out separately within their assets. But we'll just keep ours really simple right now and we'll say we have a total asset base of 160000 And uh, we're a proprietorship, so we'll just have owner's equity, which would be the amount of money I in either initially put in and then that was added to that through retaining profits, through making money and, and retaining profits. So that we'll call that Tyler's equity. And let's say, you know, maybe I initially put in $20,000 to start this business and we've been successful for a few years. So I've retained another 20,000 in earnings. So I have 40,000 in personal equity in the business. Well, that means the rest of my assets would have to be funded by liabilities, wouldn't they? Now, of course I could have put in $160,000. I put opened a bank account for ten thousand dollars, bought the fifty thousand worth of mowers, bought the hundred thousand worth of buildings and land, but uh, that's typically not how it goes. So you, you know, in any business, and in, in in most business or many business settings, they typically operate with some more or less on the basis of OPM, other people's money, and that's smart for a lot of reasons because it might take me a long time to save up the hundred sixty thousand, and the time it takes me doing another job where I maybe make less money to save up the 160000 is time that I'm losing where I could be running my mowing business and making, making good money doing my business. So we're using other people's money. We could use it as equity. We could look for investors. And a small business is probably more likely to be liability. So uh, the main source of a lot of this funds might have been a bank loan. And let's say we borrowed 100000 from the bank to acquire the mowing equipment. And maybe you know we have a mortgage on our shop building and land, and maybe that's you know only 80% or something. So we've funded a combination of these assets with a, a loan from the bank, a business loan, and that means what we total at liabilities plus equity has to equal assets. So there's another 20,000 hiding in here somewhere, and you know, and maybe that's um, uh, let's say that's a credit card. We used a credit card to finance some of our equipment. Maybe not the best way, but we, we had to because we were uh, starting up and the bank wouldn't loan us any extra money. So there's a whole lot of other options we could list in here. If we were a really big corporation, we might have issued some bonds, right? But the, the economic characteristic of all this is the same. Money that we owe, okay, our liabilities, plus the ownership claim in the business. So our total uh, total liabilities plus equity is by definition going to add up to 160,000 because it has to balance. The balance sheet has to balance. So our total assets equals our total liabilities plus equity. Okay, so we got a really good idea, I hope, of, of what's going on here in the balance sheet. And now we can use that going forward to think about these major issues within financial management. And we're just going to do a little brief run through here to kind of get a sense for this. And then later in the course, we'll delve deeper into each of these as we get into progress through the textbook and through the course. And these are capital budgeting, capital structure, working capital management, and investments. And we'll take a brief look at each of these in turn with reference to the balance sheet to think about what's going on in the business and what, what these decisions are about. So first off, capital budgeting. You'll notice up here we're looking at the long-term assets part of the balance sheet. And this deals with the investment in long-term real assets. For example, in what projects should the firm invest? We have ideas about we want to expand the business. In my mowing business, it would be, you know, do I want to buy some, some big new mowers? Or do we need some more trucks? Do we need to hire more crews? Uh, so how are we going to finance the purchase of that equipment? Capital structure policy is kind of the opposite side of that, how we're going to pay for it. Long-term financing of the firm's activities. What mix of long-term debt and equity will the firm use? Small businesses often rely largely on debt. Uh, larger corporations are going to rely more on equity. They'll issue shares to the public. They can raise a lot of money that way. But large corporations are always going to have a mix of debt and equity because of fluctuations in market conditions and interest rates and and just uh, tax issues. Uh, debt cost is tax deductible. So there's a whole lot of factors from economic forces and, and regulatory forces that are influencing that. Next, we have working capital management. This deals with the management of short-term current assets, which are basically equivalent to cash. So it could be cash in the bank, 
And the question is something like, how much cash should we have in the bank? Should we pay cash or credit for, for supplies? Should we take our excess cash? Should we invest that in, in short-term securities that give us maybe a little bit of interest but are still convertible easily in case we need cash in the future? And then finally, investments. Now, the investor's perspective, we're talking to you about stock or bonds. Stockholders are owners of the firm. Bondholders are creditors of the firm. And if we're a financial manager within a business, we could be making investments on behalf of the business in the stock of other businesses. So we could be buying shares of other companies or buying bonds of other companies. So we're really talking about uh, the portfolio, which would be on the long-term asset side of the balance sheet equation here. So we're talking about investments, securities like stocks and bonds. Should we acquire them in order to enhance our rate of return on our overall investment in the company, which of course our overall investment is everything we've acquired here by borrowing or ownership claims over here. For investors, what matters is the rate of return on a security, and we'll, we'll get into more detail on that concept when we talk about interest rates. Two things just to be aware of now though, and in, uh, in a preview sense, uh, risk return trade-offs. High returns come with high risk, and low returns go with low risk. So if we want to make a greater rate of return on the investments, we have to accept a higher riskiness, which means there's going to be more volatility, more fluctuation in the value of those investments in the short run. From the firm's perspective, the rate of return, what the investors are trying to earn, represents the cost of funds, the cost you have to pay. Investors demand 10% uh, interest for lending us money. Well, our cost of capital is 10%. So we got to think about from the business side, are there ways to lower the riskiness, the, the perceived riskiness of our operations in order to, to get funds at a lower rate? The difference between paying 5 and 10% for the funds we need to run the business could be the difference between showing a profit or a loss at the end of the year when we you know close the books and size up our performance. Okay, so that that's a picture of the kind of things we're going to be talking about in this course. I know that there's probably a lot of new concepts in there, so we're going to try to take it pretty slow, and, and we'll review, of course, in the textbook and quizzes and things of that nature, and we'll get up to speed on all this uh, terminology and concepts. And let me give you a little short preview of what we're going to be doing next and continuing Unit 1. First off, we're going to delve into a lot more detail on the concept of interest and interest rates. Interest is the price of money, the price of financial capital, the price paid if you want to borrow it, the price you earn if you have money, if you're a saver and an investor and you want to sell it. So uh, we'll get into the kind of the fundamental concept of interest and then we'll talk about some factors that make interest rates go up and down. Financial markets. This is just a nexus or a, you know, a constellation of different kinds of entities that provide and use funds. So households earn income, have some savings, they put it in the bank, banks are making loans, corporations are wanting to borrow, corporations are issuing stocks and bonds. So the combination of all those players and their interactions creates financial markets and through the actions of financial markets we get interest rates and rates of return and, and stock market valuations and all that fun stuff. So we'll, we'll delve into that stuff a little bit more. We'll talk about financial instruments or securities which are really just uh, debt is just structured form of borrowing and lending and stock uh, stocks are just structured vehicles for owning proportionate claims in a business so we'll talk more about some related concepts with that and then financial institutions fi intermediaries I've talked about this already the go-betweens between people who have money people who need money uh, the textbook uses this terminology and I think we should start off uh, get familiar with it right now Surplus units and deficit units. Surplus units are people who have extra money, savers. And deficit units are people who need money, borrowers. And the financial intermediary here is just the go-between, the, the class of, of people, of entrepreneurs, who collect the money on this side and then earn some money by efficiently channeling it to people and assessing the risks over on this side. So we'll talk a little bit more about, about how that works and then we'll talk about the different kinds of financial institutions and kind of their unique features and strategies. And then we have government also as a big player through legislating and making regulations through various government agencies. Uh, the central bank, which we might talk about just a little bit, determining monetary policy, the amount of money in the economy, the level of interest rates. So if you're a financial manager, you've got to have an awareness of, of what the central bank is doing and what, whether that's putting upward or downward pressure on interest rates. 
And then finally, the, the treasury. In any country, the, tre uh, the government's treasury is going to be a large player in, in capital markets. And you know, the United States government, I like to say, is the largest debtor entity in the history of the universe. Nobody borrows more money, nobody owes more money than the United States government. So decisions by the government to, to borrow more or less money and the actions of the United States Treasury going into the bond market are going to have a huge impact on the rest of us because they're going to drive things like interest rates and, and the inflation rate and that's going to become uh, relevant information for us in the decisions we all have to make managing our own personal finances and not to mention the, our business financial situation. So there you have it. A little, a little uh, preview, a little taste of what we're going to be talking about in the course. Look forward to seeing you next time when we delve into interest rates and financial markets.